What it do, people folk? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's what All Blake right. does these. <laughs> yeah. How about it, Barn Burners? We're back and we have a special guest today. This has been uh, several weeks, month, over a month in the making, and uh, we're honored to have Mr. Jim Panky with us today. Hey, y'all. Uh, Jim Panky here. I probably need to lean over so folks know who I am if they follow me. <laughs> well, so if you haven't met Jim yet or you don't know what Jim does, um, by the end of this video, you will. Uh, Jim is a, a phenomenal guitarist, banjo player, ukulele player. What else do you play, Jim? Pretty much anything with strings. Anything with strings. I'm the worst fiddle player you've ever heard, but, uh, you know. <laughs> well, at least, <laughs> you, at least you're honest. <laughs> there you go. But uh, I've known Jim, God, Jim, over oh, well over 10 years um, through uh, scouting. His son and my son both went in the Air Force uh, after they got their Eagle Scout. And uh, Jim and I, I remember the first time I saw Jim, and I walked up to a uh, it was a Boy Scout event, and he pulled out that banjo. And the first thing I said to myself, being a musician, I was like, this is either going to be really great or really bad. It was the great part. I didn't disappoint. No, sir. You don't suck <laughs> at all. All right, so, Jim, how long have you played? I started playing in 1977. 1977. I, I was 13, turned 14. And what did you year? start on? I started on, well... I started out on mandolin and then I went mandolin, guitar, and banjo all within about a six months period. So I started fooling with the mandolin, just chords and stuff. And then guitar, same. And then mom had old banjo and hanging in the closet that nobody ever messed with. So I started, I started playing, playing on that. And then that Christmas dad got me a, got me a flyswatter banjo. It was like a hundred dollar factory second k banjo <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter what name's on it though if you got the passion for it and uh so i played that so yeah it's so 1977 1977 and once i started on banjo i really wasn't interested in doing anything else i mean i, I still play other stuff but right banjo is your bread and bread and butter yeah it was the focus it's the only thing i ever it it, it made sense Kind of. Well, no, it still makes sense. I still watch you play <laughs> on a regular. It still makes sense. Um, so you've, how long have you played? For, so, so played out, so uh, gigged, etc. Oh, gosh. So, you know, I was playing stuff with dad. Dad played guitar. Right. And like his, pickings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so his sisters all sang. And then we would go out to churches and just play music for his sisters to sing. And so yeah. we started out doing that. And then I started at Murray County High School and I'm sitting on a school bus. And the guy I'm sitting next to, just kind of intimidating looking guy, you know, it just or to me at the time, you know, <laughs> it was like looking back, it really wasn't that intimidating. But right. you know, at the time. And we got to talk and he's like, Well, I play guitar. And I said, Well, I'll play banjo. He says, You know what you ought to do is you ought to join the FFA. And we'll start a string band. I said, what's FFA? I didn't know. <laughs> and so we started. So I started with Future Farmers of America. And at Murray County High School, from, from in the 30s and 40s, the school was built in 1934. So early on, they started having boys would come that were part of the agriculture program. And they just after school or whenever, they'd sit around and play music. And so the string band tradition kind of happened so we did that and so it was me mark tatum kelvin davenport and bobby patterson put together this little string band and then later we added rob leonard but we so that technically been the first band in what 1978 oh, 79 i mean i was that's... maybe playing just a little over a year before we started actually playing and going out and playing you know we we would play for the local Civitan, Lions Club, stuff like that. Anybody and that would have you, right? Anybody that would do it, you know, <laughs> and, and, and pay. Like, if we played the local civic groups, being part of the FFA, we would we would get paid, usually in livestock. Oh, wow. So we, we had, so <laughs> That's cool. one, of, one, of, one, of the, one of the FFA things back in the day is we had a thing called a pig chain. And we would have some, a boy would get a pig. And you raise it up, a gilt, you raise it up, female, and then you get that gilt bread, she'd have piglets, and then other boys could have a piglet off of that. Oh, 
And so we started Pig Chance. So the first thing I ever got paid for playing was a pig. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, awesome. could you imagine Who that? Who doesn't like that? <laughs> <laughs> Which was a pretty, pretty swell deal. Yeah. You know? I like, mean, imagine playing a gig and they're like, did a good job, fellas. Here's your goat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can pick your goat in a minute. Yeah. Here's your piglet. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's cool. I mean, that's and, better than some of the some of the things I've been paid. Well, which was the arbinger of what most bluegrass musicians wind up playing for is barbecue. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Oh, yes. so technically, oh, yes. it was still yeah. barbecue. Yeah. It was just raw, <laughs> <laughs> raw barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Raw barbecue that it's you still have to feed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had to feed it for several <laughs> months. But, but yeah, so I've been playing out since then. And, and even like, so all through high school we were playing. And, and then we got to where we were playing some actual booked jobs. You know, yeah. I guess first actual job jobs we played was Ringgold 1890s Day back oh, in hey, yeah, 1980 yeah. or 81. Yeah. It's one of the very first ones. And That's we cool. played it and we and then we played at the uh, FFA National Convention out in Kansas City. Oh, that's cool. And so that was to about 30,000 people. So that that's was a big a, audience that's right off the bat. Great you know? exposure <laughs> right off the rip. Yeah. Um, so we got to where you, you kind of started from. Yeah. Now, I know you personally, and I, I know about you. Um, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll work through it. <laughs> Tell me your favorite moment on stage. Oh, where yeah. you were, who it was with, what yeah. artist, etc. Oh, Your wow. favorite yeah, time on stage. Man, this, people ask me stuff like this, and I'm always like, I don't know. I know, it's hard, it, it's hard it, to well, nail it down. So I got, I, I've done done a variety of things. And, you know, as a kid, that thing at the can, in Kansas City National Convention was awesome. So the first time I remember ever playing anywhere where people did the wave. It was in a huge like Coliseum auditorium right. thing there in Kansas City, and people were doing the wave around the top of the balcony. I'm going, that's for us. You know? yeah, <laughs> so that, that was pretty cool. That would definitely wind and, you up a little bit. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, two thousand twelve. So we're going to come way forward from that because the high school was a long time ago. <laughs> but played. Uh, did a tour of Ireland with Curtis Blackwell. He was one of Bill Monroe's guys and uh -huh. did a tour over there. Did uh, 21 days in Ireland, 21 shows. And that was pretty cool. So every, everywhere there was pretty neat. We, Ireland was definitely on the bucket list. We played in one building that was like 600 years old. Yeah. You know, that, <laughs> and so that, that was, that was neat. And I guess the th so we, we're playing this place in Belfast called the Black Box, and it's just a it's a club where they play music. Yeah. And it's painted solid black inside. You walk in, it's just black. Just black. It's a perfect <laughs> name for it. And so we're playing, and it's it's our very first gig in Ireland, and we're we're doing great. And, and Curtis, he's fantastic with the crowd. Knows how to play a crowd. Knows how to talk to folks. Just real personable and he's doing all his stuff and this crowd is just like dead silent they're not they're not responding or anything that we're doing while we're playing it's like oh this is gonna be a tough show it's gonna be a tough show and as soon as we quit playing as soon as the last note played on that first song they erupted the crowd just loved it i'm going ah this is interesting. And so Curtis is introduced. So he starts to talk. They get quieter. He introduced the next song. And when we kicked it off, they were dead silent. They listened to every note. And while we were there, we went to a bunch of little different places, pubs. And we went, uh, where was it? I can't remember the little town. We went to this one little pub. And it was, they had a little singer's club. And folks would just sit around tables in the big pub area and they would sing songs and they might have accompaniment. They might just sing a cappella. And let's say it's just this person that's got a real timid, very low voice and they start to sing. And, and if there's people over near the bar that were a little chatty, they'd get shushed and everybody in the, Everybody in the pub would just be quiet and listen to this person sing this song. I wish we song. had that in America. I mean, <laughs> that's not, I mean, and I'm guilty of it, but there's it, nothing it was, that annoys me more than going to see a show 
and some jack wagon behind you is talking, just talking the whole time. I'd rather hear you sing out of key. <laughs> than, but uh, yeah, it was so the the amount of respect for the music that we got in Ireland. I did two tours of Ireland, one also in 2016, but the, the, the respect they have for musicians and the music, uh, it was, it was unreal. Everywhere that's, we played cool. was just, they gave the music just the utmost respect. And it was like, wow. And a lot of times musicians from America go <laughs> overseas to make it big because they, Pay attention. They can be listened to. They can be heard yeah. versus you're trying to sing to a, over a karaoke machine and 30 drunks. Well, you know, uh, an example of that, and I won't speak for them, but, you know, back back in the early 2000s, I played a little bit with Lovell Sisters mm -hmm. and who's now Larkin Poe. And once wow. once they kind of turned into Larkin Poe and Jessica quit the band, and so it's just Megan and Becky, and they are they started playing like, uh, Scandinavia, you know, like oh, Norway, yeah, Denmark, cool. and all of that, and they're you know, and then that's where they started to gain some traction, and because it wasn't happening here, and so right, they and went I, somewhere that well, folks were listening to the music. Kings of Leon, <laughs> they had to go overseas really to get their start, and then when they got back to the U.S., they were huge, yeah, and true. selling out everything. It's it's they have a different respect for for music and arts in general, and, and, and they respect it. I mean, if you go out to a bar on Friday night with a lot of music. I go to hear the music. I don't go to, yeah, you know. But I mean, you, you pay you pay a lot to be there. It's it's nice to be able to. to I mean, even if I pay a fifteen dollar cover, I would like to, I'd right, like to right. hear the band. I want to hear what I paid to, to yeah, hear. Yeah, yeah. And so that's you know, and, and and in an environment where it like if you like where the band doesn't have to crank it up to eleven. Correct. They can be heard. Yeah, yeah. That's not always nice. Not having a blistering yeah. amplifier behind you. Went to uh, went and watched the Squirrel Nut Zippers a couple months ago, and you know, they they were at Songbirds, and on on the way there, stopped at the Walgreens and picked out a couple of pair of earplugs. So, so right. That, yeah. Because uh, you know, in the small venue, and I knew it was going to have to be loud to be heard over the folks that were yeah. drinking in the back. Yeah, and that's I try to get up front in a lot of shows because if you get right up front, you don't have those mains pointing yeah, exactly. right at you. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. And everybody's like, "Why do you want to get up front?" I'm like, "Because I want to hear." I don't, right. you know, either you get up front or you wear earplugs in the back. It's exactly. Either, yes, that's it, the way it works. Either yeah. way, that's where we saw 49 Winchester the first time. Was at Songbirds. Yeah. yeah. You can imagine that band in that little room. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was very loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've played with a lot of people. Yeah. So what's your favorite person you've ever played with? Oh gosh, I don't know. You know, so in 2000, I started playing with Roy Curry. Okay. And Roy's in Chattanooga and Roy's a guitar player and is phenomenal. And he played, he played with Danny Shirley, played with the Forrester sisters and he's just an amazing guitarist. And, and so, as far as somebody that I've played with that challenges me that I enjoy playing with, yeah, Roy Roy's probably tops. I mean, of all yeah. the people I've played with. And then there's Owen Saunders, fiddle player. Uh, Owen used to play with Doyle Lawson. He's, oh, from, wow. he's from he's from like Florida, but he's he, he lives up on Signal now. And Owen's just one of the best fiddle players I've ever played with. I mean, he's just something about his playing is just real greasy. Yeah, it's just like it's just yeah. like it's just some you know it's not. Highly technical. It's not, you know, perfect. It's just, it's him. It's just great. Yeah, you know? yeah it's, <laughs> it's just like, him. And, and so, but those two guys are are a lot of fun. I mean, I've hung out with a lot of famous guys. Bill Keith, a uh, banjo player, played with Monroe back in the '60s, and real hero of mine. I got to hang out a bunch with Bill, and felt like, you know, I, you know, we we had a friendship uh, to the respect that he'd send me. Goofy text at two in the morning, <laughs> but I learned a bunch from Bill. It was fun to just sit around and, and just play with Bill, but it was mostly just me watching him never run out of ideas. You know, we just take a simple tune and, and I play it and then Bill play it and I play it and then Bill play it different. And then I play it again. He played it different again. You know, it was just, he just never ran out of ideas. And yeah. I was just always stood at, I mean, pure, 
I mean, I've been around some musical geniuses, and Bill definitely one of them. And it's like, and those guys are here local, right? Now, Bill was in Woodstock, New York. Okay, so he's oh. in. So, do yeah. you, are you still playing with? Is it was it Chattanooga? So we had Ram- Ham- no. no Hamilton so County. We had a Hamilton County Ramblers. Uh, we did that for two years. That was our commitment to it to see if we can make it fly. And you know how it is in the music industry; it either fly or it won't. And so Correct. it did not. So we all went about our business. Uh, James, our lead singer, is playing with band in Nashville called East Nash Grass. They are kind of hot up and coming right now. And they're yeah. amazing. Nice. And so, and then our bass player, he's fire department and then Roy and I still play together. And then a fiddle player, he back to doing what he always did is he's just a hired gun on the fiddle and yeah. plays with different folks and studio work and yeah. lessons and stuff. So that, there's, you know, there's we, very good money in that. <laughs> so, and, and you know, it, it's, it's like when we did that Ramblers album, it was like, how much money do we want to spend on this? And, you know, it's like well, all of it. Uh, yeah. We spent a lot of money and it felt like we did all the right things. But it's just you, know, it's, you, 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 you could have an absolute diamond sitting here. And if nobody sees it, and nobody, you know, right. the, the, the wrong people see it, it it's just going to continue to sit there. And so. things, things are a lot different now. That's what we're talking about. You don't have to go out now and play. No. It's the, you have the interweb and all, uh, you can uh, from TikTok which you have a very I large do. TikTok yeah, following YouTube you have a very large mm-hmm. large following I mean that is if you're going to get found I mean how many views does your average video get well I Just mean an average well okay did a little live stream yesterday uh, it's at about 1500 views at the moment so since that was yesterday. Since yesterday. Since yesterday. So, but like you, if I do an instruction video, you know, I could literally get 10,000 views in a day. Right. So, yeah. and then my, my whole point behind that is when every day you can put yourself in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. Every day without yeah. leaving the comforts of your home. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and, but you make, you make an impact. Matter of fact, I saw a, a kid on the news uh, one time and you got tagged in it. I was a young kid. Oh, yeah. I know who you're little, talking little about. Little redhead kid. I need to check on him. And uh, <laughs> he was on the news playing the banjo. And they were like, where'd you learn how to play? And he said, I learned to play from Jim Panky. That is exactly <laughs> what he said. That's awesome. Uh, that's yeah. Cool. But the kid was like. He was really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was really good. So yeah. uh, and that's great. So Jim puts out inf- uh, instructional. And tabs, you rack your own tab. I, I, yeah, I do. I Boy, I was so reluctant in that because I. I I just, I, to, I, I tab, That's a lot. tabs are, tabs are the devil, uh, they, <laughs> I, you know, because like, I, I resisted doing tabs for stuff because I really feel like for a person to learn an instrument, they got to be able to hear it. I agree. And if you're always married to this piece of paper. Right. And, and especially adults, when we see stuff written out, we think that's how it's supposed to be. Right. And we don't have this nature about us to just make it our own. Right. And There's no ad lib. No, you play it's, it's exactly got to be, like it's got it. to be it on the paper. And so I was real resistant to it, but I got sick and was stuck at home and had to have something to do and my, you know, bide my time and try to be productive. And I thought, well, I'll just go back and transcribe all those old videos that I had done. And just, and so I did, I went back and did transcriptions for all those old videos and created all the tabs. It's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, you know, if I couldn't sit and pick, I could sit and transcribe. Holy and so crap. I transcribed all of that. And so now it's kind of become a thing. You know, if I do a video, I have to do the tab, but, but, but the tabs, People pay for them. And, and so I don't do, so all of my instruction is free. You can go and watch all the instruction and it stands alone without the piece of paper. But some people just, they got to have the paper. Yeah. And so I charge two bucks a pop for the tabs. And might I, as well. That's yeah. about a, and at this point, it's about a third of my income is. Wow. At $2 a time. Well, I mean, wow, you, you think crazy. about it, you've got so many people and, and I'm with you. So I play by ear. I've always played mm-hmm. by ear. I can read music when it comes to drums, but I always felt that if you needed that sheet of paper to get you through that song, you were in the wrong spot. Right. I mean, I can, I can rebuild an engine by reading the directions and following them, but somebody pulls the directions away and I'm halfway through. 
what happens now, and a lot of times mm -hmm. you see tablets and stuff, everybody's got their iPads up on the stage oh, yeah. with their cheat sheets. What happens when your battery dies? Oh, I know. You know, you've got, I mean, for me, I enjoy playing the music and yeah, figuring it, it out. There's a big backlash now for certain bands. They, like, they couldn't go on because their laptops, they couldn't find their laptops. Really? Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen it happen with hey, a yeah. laptop sometimes, and a MIDI player. Sometimes that's like that's a showstopper. Yeah. Mm. I mean, sometimes it's it's their lights that's mm -hmm. run by that or mm. something. But a lot of times it's like backing tracks and right. like a Track. click and everything. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I did this job with this, with this guy a couple of years ago, and you know he's setting up. We're setting up sound, and he's there. It is Mike, and he's got a little thing he's mounted to it, and he's got his iPad mounted there. And I said, "What is that?" He says, "That's all my song lyrics." You don't have that all in your head. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, the amount of I, I'm not even a singer, and the amount of time that I've spent learning lyrics has I mean, that's part of it. I, I I won't perform a song out if I don't know the words, or if I don't know the chord changes. Even you know, I've I've played with bands and and they'll want me to come and fill in, and it's like, okay, I'm listening to some of your stuff. There's some weirdness in this song. Send me send me a chart, and then I'll learn it before I get to the gig. I'm not going to have a chart laying out somewhere. Right. That's that's weird. Imagine that learning something yeah. before you get there. <laughs> yeah, that's always been my issue. Was like people that go out and play in bars and they sing and stuff. It's like. If you're reading while you're singing it, or at least I know for me, because right. I can't do two things at once, I don't seem like. But if you're reading while you're singing it, are you really doing what you want to to that song? You're not. Right. Really, you're giving you're giving half your effort to reading it, and half your effort yeah. to singing it. And, 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 and you've forgotten your too. you've forgotten your audience. Yeah, right. Yeah. And yeah. then then you miss a word, and I don't know if you've ever missed a word on a tablet like that. And then you try to find where you were. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> That's one of the things. So one of the things I've started doing, like on my TikTok live stream. So I, I do a live stream, not every night, but several nights a week. I'll just sit up in my bed with my banjo, sit the camera out, and just do a live stream on TikTok. We've watched it here before, yeah. and you know, and so one of the things that just a couple of nights ago, somebody was asking me why, why I'm never really looking at the camera. So I was get the camera here, but then I've got it screen shared to my TV so I can read what's going across because okay. I can't read that right. from over there. And so now I've got, gotten to this thing where I stare at the camera while I'm playing stuff and it, it <laughs> makes folks uncomfortable and I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> so, uh, so Jim brought us these and uh, <laughs> this is cool. He has his own trading cards. So yeah, Bluegrass All-Stars dot com i think and uh yeah you can go you can go check out all of the the banjo cards and it, it has so it's a set of 42 cards and it's got all of the all of the banjo heroes earl scruggs ralph stanley is, all of these and i was very honored and <laughs> flabbergasted that i was in one of the 42 because if you ask me to name 42 banjo players i'm not in that list i mean i, uh, I, mean, I understand I, uh, well you said earl scruggs uh, yeah. i can only imagine that he was probably a uh, number one yeah i i think that I, I can't remember how the cards are numbered i think they're actually just alphabetically oh yeah well but you know so i'm number 23 which is evidently a good number well that is too cool because i've always been in a, like trading cards like, <laughs> yeah so i mean similar. that's really that's so yeah really cool and we've talked about it i mean we've talked yeah, we about are. and and we got some stuff we'll show you here in a little bit that we're working on. And uh, you're going to see Jim in an upcoming video because we have made him something. Uh, it didn't help that I had COVID last week and we did not get done. So what we're going to do, we're going to go meet Jim, hopefully one day in the next couple of weeks, uh, present him with this, buy him dinner, sit around and talk uh, <laughs> without cameras on us. Uh, but you'll have to you'll have to see what we what we've got in store for him. It's yeah. pretty stinking cool. Be amusing. I, Yo, I, it's, can, I can uh, I can hardly wait. Amusing. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. I can hardly wait. So what, what, what you got here? They call this a banjo. Just get off. That is cool. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly was something y'all would have done to me. So I'm glad it came back around here. <laughs> <y 'all. laughs> Yeah, this is what they call a banjo. Uh, this, <laughs> this is from this is from Recording King. So 
2011, is. Recording King approached me about an artist endorsement. And so I'm like, send me something. Let's see. Let's see what it is. And they sent me, not this one, it was RK35. It's like, at the time, I think it's like a $700 banjo. So not super high end, but not, not a fly swatter either. And it was really good. I mean, it was really good. As a matter of fact, we were talking about different places that I had played. So the RK35, I, I installed a pickup in it, and I got this job as staff band for the Ralph Stanley Memorial that they did at the Grand Ole Opry. And so that's the banjo I, you know, that I used on, on the Opry. So, which was kind of cool, you know, using my $700 banjo on, mm -hmm. on that stage. But it just speaks to how, how much I liked the instrument, you know, how it sounded and everything. And then a few years later, they started doing these. And, you know, it looks old because I, I'm hard on gear. Uh, but they they sent me this one. And this is kind of on, it, it's not mine, it's on loan, but I've had it since 2013. So I, I don't think they're, I don't think they want it back. Well, but, they, they might. Uh, but, uh, but that yeah, is it's, gorgeous. It's, it's curly maple and uh, it's just a, it's just a nice piece. And, you know, it's, a, you know, it makes banjo noise. Cool. And, uh and for all the banjo nerds, uh, well, they'll be on here because you're on here. I, I'm using Brian Hooper Bridge. Uh, Brian's over in Blairsville, Georgia. BrianHooper.com. It's Brian with a Y. And uh, I, I've got the capo is a one of the G7 Heritage capos, and they're pricey. But that's the smallest capo I've ever seen. Yeah, <laughs> it's delicate. Yeah, you know, it, it's pricey. And then. I've got the Cheetah Keys, and you know I don't do much. I just I just play it. Uh, well, I'd love to hear that one. Yeah. So yeah, and this is kind of my this is one I play every day. Okay, so, so that's your every day. This is my every day. This is one is I get. Is that the campfire guitar? So if you were going to a campfire, that's the banjo you're going to pick yeah, up. Yeah, and I mean it's you know it, it's it's a high grade quality instrument. So 1987 or so, Greg Rich, he's a instrument dude. Started working with Gibson, and they redone all of their banjo line and Greg was behind that. So Greg Rich, Don Hunter and Ed Weber were the force behind those new, newer Gibson banjos started in, in 87 and went through about 93. And those instruments are bringing big bucks now. Well, Greg, Don and Ed are the ones that did this banjo. So it's, you know, it says recording King, it's made in the USA. Right. It's, but it, it's, it's a real banjo. It's all about who touches said <laughs> yeah, instrument. And I, you know, yeah. So everything about it, everything when I got it was absolutely perfect. The finish Don Hunter did was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, the neck, the feel in the neck and everything, that's Ed Weber. So yeah. It, and you've had that one since 2013? 13. 2013. Yeah, I don't think they're coming back after it. Yeah, it's been you know, 10, years, 10 years, Jim. Well, they're aware. You know? <laughs> yeah, they know where it's at. <laughs> they know where it is if but. they want it. Uh, and they, so this line they did, this is the M5, which was the maple one. Then they did an M7, which was mahogany, and M9, which was walnut. And they're all similar. They, you know, it's not like one was higher number was the better instrument. They're just different woods. And so I, I, I've always been. A, Do you find with the different woods? So we've had this conversation. With the different woods in a banjo, does it matter? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, well, there's a lot of resonance going on with a banjo versus an electric guitar, where I don't feel the, the wood matters. Yeah. So With well, electrics. Where you're going to notice the difference, in, it, it's not so much what the body's made of, but it's what the neck is made okay. of. And this is the tone difference. So I had, I had a neck banjo back 
a while back, and they're fairly modular. And banjos, you can take them apart with a adjustable wrench and a screwdriver. You know, it's really yeah. not a musical instrument. It's more like a set of drums. And <laughs> <laughs> <Got> a point. <laughs> but uh, I was needing, a, so that banjo was needing a fret job. And the dude that built it, I uh, went and saw him. He, We were like in the same locale. And he said, why don't I just give you this neck and I'll just take that one. And so he handed me a neck and it was walnut. And I put it on the banjo. It totally changed the sound. Okay. So going from a mahogany neck to a walnut, it was it was okay. a it was a big difference. So for sure on a banjo, you, you definitely notice the difference. So maple typically is brighter sounding. Okay. Mahogany is going to be a little warmer, and walnut's going to fall somewhere on the in between. Now you, you know people are building them out of everything else, but those are the three that I'm most familiar with. Oh, how they're going to sound. I wanted to ask that question because we've had that conversation, like. If I have a Gibson SG right here and a mm -hmm. Gibson SG right here and one's mahogany, and it, it's the pickups are what pickups make a huge the difference. Pickups are what you're getting the sound from. Yeah. And I can't hear, I can't hear the difference. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, now, but I won't, den I won't deny anybody else saying that they right, can't, right, right. <laughs> but, I won't deny it. but sometimes, but you know, the, but we have that in the banjo world too. You know, people, people are always seeking out those old, Pre World War II Gibson Master Tone banjos, which are now bringing five to six figures, and it's like, and and I go every year to Banjothon, which all these old Gibson guys come and bring their old stuff, and you can play them. And it's like, yeah, I don't know, I, I'm happy with a banjo from 2013. It's, I don't hear it, but some of them do. Hey, well, I think a lot of it, and that's one heck of a name to put. You and know. if you spend fifty thousand dollars on something, then your ears are going to hear it. Well, I better. <laughs> Psychologically, you tell yourself it sounds Or right. you have too much money. Uh, one of the two. But this is the Recording King, and uh, this is, you know, like, I, I gig with this. If, if, it's a, if it's a job where I don't plug in, this is the one that I get. So you played that on the Grand Ole Opry? Not this one. Not that the, one. But the previous one. The previous this. one. Yeah. And uh, who were you playing with on the Grand Ole Opry? It was a Opera? staff band. So it was a bunch of guys that were put together to to provide music for various artists that came out to do music for the Ralph Stanley Memorial. So like Dale Singletary was there. I don't know, a bunch of Opry people. Uh, Garth and Trisha were there, but they weren't performing, but their daughter was. And so they were hanging out backstage and you know, got to meet cool. all of them. And uh, so that's what that was for. And so that was plug-in gig. So I carried well, them. Just to play on the Opry? It was pretty cool. It, it was. That's like a big check yeah. in the box. And see, I was trying to think of other band members. One of the other band members that you'll you'll know, the name is Mark Herndon. Yeah. So Mark, Mark was like, hey, man, he beats up a set of drums, man. Yeah. I've never seen somebody play so hard. Yeah. So, he, yeah, he's a... He sings too, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, and so whatever the whatever the stage snare was, you know. So we come off stage, and Mark's like, "I'm gonna have to have another snare." He says, "I have chased this one all over." The yeah, <laughs> once well, they get to walking, man, it's it's <laughs> like you're trying to do it nonchalantly, but literally, it, hi hats are the worst. Yeah, because I'll be playing and it starts scooting out, and I'm trying to drag it back in with my foot while still playing. Yeah, it, it gets bad. So Rodney Quarles was there. I don't know if you know Rodney, but anyway, he's, he's, a, he's a drummer slash lawyer, and he was there, and he had this really nice Ludwig snare, and I swear the rim on it was two and a half inches yeah. or more, and you pick, it felt like a banjo when you're picking it up, and it's like, okay. And so he gave that to Mark to play, and he didn't chase it anymore. You know, it's just stay, <laughs> it stayed put. I guess that's what know? I like about banjo is it's really a snare drum. It, it, it's yeah, and it's just, the resonator <laughs> is the strings now instead yeah, of yeah. where we have. I have a resonator, some resonator strings on the bottom of the yeah. snare. You're actually playing. Yeah, we just pick them. You know? Yeah. So I guess that's why I like banjo so much. It's like that's a drum. <laughs> They're heavy right. too, just in case you wondered. Yeah. Is it like carrying a drum around? It's twelve I've always, pounds. I've always <laughs> been surprised at how heavy a banjo yeah, is. Yeah, it's twelve they're twelve pounds. Or that one is. Yeah. Uh Chris actually played the banjo with us on a, a song. Uh it's heavier than Les Paul. And he it just is. he just grabbed it and just started trying to figure something out, right? And it yeah, it, it is it is sloppy, but well, I mean, it served the purpose, I guess. Yeah. It sounded like a banjo when that, you played it. That seemed, you know, <laughs> it sounded like a guitar. And, and, and 
and, and no disrespect to anybody out there that does this and likes this, but like Tyler Childers, there's a couple of his tunes that have banjo in it. And I get requests for those tunes all, all the, time. the time. And it's like, and so I went out and transcribed a couple of them just to see. And it's like, no, I'm not sharing that with the world. It's just terrible. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like they just handed some dude a banjo and says, here, you're playing banjo. Yeah. And, and they, they Well, that's the problem with the studio is, <laughs> is they can cut and piece together everything you hear. Yeah. They can make me sound great on a banjo. And I don't yeah. play banjo. Yeah. So. And, and that in some of the stuff that was going on, it's like, yeah, I, I know what's happening there. And no, there's no way that I'm going to, I don't, I don't want my students to learn that. You know, I would like them to learn something banjo. Right. And after related. being a recording artist and, and going in a studio and being studio musician and yeah. understanding how things work, you listen to music a lot differently. Oh, and for sure. correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll listen to some music. I'm like, he's he didn't, they didn't do that. And it, they didn't, it, it it's you can add anything in that you want to add in. What did we put in one of ours? A slide thing or something? Oh, we, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it's whatever <laughs> you want to put in it, whether it's dogs barking to whatever. Oh, yeah. it's, it's just a click, on click, and uh, it's in. Oh, and and fixing things. So this is the banjo I used on the Hamilton County Ramblers album. I'll get you a link for that. But yeah. uh, these tuners are. They're, they're five stars from uh, Stumac. I hate them. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're problematic. And, but they're, they're four to one planetary tuners. They're, they're always going to suck, even in the best case scenario. And so we're doing this tune, and there's this one note where in the tune I run up to that note, and it's way flat. And you really didn't notice it until I, I landed on that note. And then I'm telling Brent Truitt, you know, I said, I need to run back and fix that. And he says, I already fixed it. <laughs> I said, how did you fix it? Did you, you, did you retune it? He says, no, but you played that note earlier. And so I just used that I note. I grabbed for, it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, that's yeah. kind of, I said, is that cheating? He says, you played it. Yeah, I mean, it's your work. <laughs> it you, was my note. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, there's a lot of our stuff that gets cut. But, I mean, it has yeah. to, so you never know when one, one cut's going to have that great something in it yeah. that you want. And, you're not going to probably play it like that again. Exactly. So I just, I mean, I, and I get it, but what I, what I do back to the, the tablets and uh, MacBooks on stage, if you rely on that, I don't need to come see you. No, yeah, it's I, just, I just, I just want to hear the music. Correct. And, and now running lots and stuff, I get it. But when you're running MIDI and you've got your keyboards run through there, then you have your backing track and your vocals coming through there, your click track. One thing goes wrong especially with the click, everybody's lost it. And, oh, yeah. and then you see everybody reaching for their in-ears, trying to pull them out on stage and trying to find the drummer, praying right. to God he ain't lost it. <laughs> we know how you are with timing. Dude, I'm awful. <laughs> I, I need you. I can't play without a drummer. But I like mistakes. I like when you go hear a band yeah. and it's like, oh, he messed up the lyrics. I know that. Right. Yeah. He, and, and he then, can mess up. And then on the Foggy Mountain Banjo album, they're uh, – Earl plays Sally Gooden, and Earl just kills it. But Jake, the bass player, is upside down the whole way through it. So he's he's you know he's five one five one five one all the way through this thing, and it's just it's got the and they just went with it, and it works. And and when you hear it, you know it, and you think, man, that sounds so good. And it's like, why is that so different? And it's because it was an the, accident. It, the bass was wrong. Yeah, I mean. And, but, it you know, happens. they're cutting back then, you know, they're cutting it all live to one microphone. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's and, like, and it wasn't a mic like these. It, no, was, it was a big ribbon mic. Yeah. And, and it's like, and everybody else is like, Earl's like, man, I just, uh, I, I killed that. And everybody else is like, man, that sounded great. And they're all looking at Jake probably going, what the heck was wrong <laughs> with you? What were you doing? <laughs> and they're like, well, let's listen to it. And I'm sure they just... Obviously, they decided to let it let it run. That's not. I mean, wasn't yeah, I mean, too terrible. Yeah, it, I mean, was, it was great. Sometimes the accidents are, yeah. are pretty pretty cool. And so, but yeah, I I too appreciate you know when you when you hear them do stuff or have to start over, or start something in the wrong key or whatever. Yeah, we've yeah. done that a few times. <laughs> it, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, so, recording king, obviously mm -hmm. a great banjo yeah if, if if you were going to go and and recommend start out 
Start yeah. out banjo. Yeah, look at Recording King product line. They have stuff that starts about two hundred dollars, which is so they have them pretty from cheap. Two hundred dollars on up to about eighteen hundred bucks, I think. And I will tell you this, and this is my theory, but I, I, I do believe it holds out true. I, I saw y'all's video about buying cheap guitars. Yes, sir. All right, so which which is fun. I, I like doing that sort of thing. So what was the cheapest guitar that you bought? Uh, that would be mine, and it was $85. $85. For a banjo of that same quality, it'd be three times that. So a $100 okay. banjo is a $30 guitar. Okay. <laughs> so, well, that's, uh, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. A lot, lot more. There, uh, I mean, you, you're parts. paying for a lot of hardware. Well, we went to Nashville, and we were like, Let's buy the cheapest get I mean, we went to Carter Vintage. Right. Yeah. That's not a good place to look for cheap <laughs> no, Well, we did it. We did it. But <laughs> so we did that right before and and they hopefully everybody's seen that we put it out there. The one I purchased, we're giving it away. As right. soon as we hit X amount of followers, somebody's getting the guitar. Um and it's a beautiful ash body. I really want to sand it down. I really want to keep it. But you're giving it away. We're giving it away. Um and and we were just like, what can we do? Right? And then we got to meet Mike Myers. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that was his name. And then we went from the cheapest guitars we could find to the absolutely most expensive. And just walking around Carter, as you know, I found the cheapest thing in there. Right. It was well, a ukulele. Probably about $300. $300 ukulele. <laughs> that was cheating, though. But the, other than that, like the cheapest probably guitar. Probably the cheapest guitar, there's going to be five or 600 bucks. Correct. And then, then we've got the ones in the cases that are... Hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Up. So I know you've brought some more banjos. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's. So if you want to grab else, another one, I'll, see what else we got. Because yeah. that that fretless one over there is pretty sl that? pretty stinking slick, man. That fretboard is nuts. If you guys want to learn how to play banjo, Jim Panky. Well, it's Wild Jimbo on. You can go to jimpanky.com. You can go to wildjimbo.com. You can find me anywhere. What year is that thing? This is new. Oh, it is. Yeah. It, it looks very vintage. Yeah. That thing oh, that sounds, sounds really good. Really good. <laughs> it so this this was banjo was a long time in the making. So that first tour we did in Ireland with uh, Curtis Blackwell, you know, I what most bands that I play with, I play three finger Earl Scruggs style, and this style kind of like Grandpa Jones, old climber. So I can do both on either banjo, but. I set the banjos up differently because it's, it's almost like a different instrument, it's, you know. And so I would always carry two banjos. Well, carrying two banjos overseas, that means I had to check one. And I wasn't real keen on checking something. It was a lot, with, with that case that that one's in, I can throw it in the overhead. It, yeah. it, it'll, it'll fit in the overhead on just about everything except for Puddle Chopper. And so... That first trip, I started looking for, well, I wonder if somebody can loan me a banjo while I'm there. So a friend of mine, Mark McClooney, hi, Mark, uh, got me hooked up with Rob Crawford. And Rob lives there. Uh, I forget where he lives. He's near, he's in Northern Ireland. And he, he built banjos. And so he loaned me a banjo to play on, on that tour. So I played it everywhere and he wound up selling several banjos because you were playing it I'm out there, playing it and people really? are seeing it. And he's, a, and so he, he approached me 10 years ago and says, I really want to build you a banjo. And I was like, hey, Rob, you don't, you don't owe me anything. I, I appreciate being able, you know, he says, but I've sold so many. He says, I, I really would like to like to make something for you. So I dodged that for a long time. And so, and then in 2016, we made another tour over there, and at that time I had a different instrument, but he came out to the shows, and we talked, and he's, he, he kind of got, so I, it had died down, but then he got kind of got back on building again. So 
first of last year, he sent me a block of wood, a picture of a block of wood. He said, that's going to be your banjo. I said, okay. And then he sent me parts and pictures all, all along. And so he built this. As a matter of fact, every, the only things on this banjo that he did not make were the, were the tuning pegs and uh, obviously the strings and the little screws that are in here. Everything else he did, all of the, all of the hardware. Oh, really? Uh, you know, he made all of the, wow. the bracket shoes, uh, tailpiece, everything. He he did he does it all right there in his that is a gorgeous right there in his shop banjo and you know he asked me he said what would you like I said well I'd like some kind of austere something fairly plain and but yet elegant and which is pretty vague but he ran with it he says all right so like you want it you know so I told him I want it fretless he says well, you want a half fretless or what do you want I said well maybe let's let's do a plate. You know, so this has got a brass plate and then the rest of it ebony because I'm not ever going to play up here. You know, that'd be pretty. He says, you want a scoop? I said, yeah, let's put a scoop because climber players, you know, we need that extra room. So he cuts out a part of the fingerboard there. And he says, you want that straight or you want a curve? I said, make it match whatever you do to the, to the, the plate. And so he did. And it's just, it, it's clever. So most banjos, you know, obviously we've got the fifth string peg and the fifth string peg on most banjos is at the fifth fret rob pushes his down to the seventh fret which is fantastic because there's no money passed there and it just gets it completely out of the way so it's just <laughs> moving you out of your out of your playing zone right and, and it did take a minute to get used to thinking oh man they're, they're, you kept thinking you're gonna run out of real estate yeah, and I, you I'm thinking i'm needing to be here when really I, i'm still just right back here which is kind of nice That's... and then his little plates you can those actually represent frets at okay you know or at least right. gives you a frame where, of reference where they should be kind of idea so but it, but it's weird after playing a fretted instrument for 40 something years when you go to a fretless instrument it's really not that hard i mean your fingers kind of know what they're supposed to do and if they're a little off you you make adjustments mm -hmm. so yeah rob built this and it's just been that thing has it's the greatest. A, I hope a, it's coming through. Yeah. So like <laughs> that, rich and like warm. I know. Sound. That one's like, that so one's like here. Ha have a glass of, 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 of bourbon. Let's yeah. sit out here and talk about it. Yeah. Is what that one feels like to me. Yeah. And, and if anybody saw the, so I, I can take the little bag out, but it, it helps with some of the overtones. So oh, okay. a lot of banjo players, especially open back banjo. The other one had a resonator that's open back. And this just kind of calms down. It doesn't change the volume or anything, but you, well, you know, like with the drum, you, you know, the gel pad. I've used gel pads. And I've done those before too. Okay. And, but the, but so this, <laughs> this, this is from Tesco in, uh, in Northern <laughs> Ireland. So, uh, it, you know, Irish banjo, Irish shop. You're not gonna, yeah, you're not going to find another bag like that around no, here. No, you know, until that one rides, well, that, I'll, I'll have to go that back. That is and, really cool. So I actually went to Ireland to get this. Because oh, it was like, how much is it going to cost to ship? And we started looking in the shipping costs. It's like, ah, oh, heck with that. I'll just come get it. So, right. I'm sure four or $500 easy. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I can fly to Dublin and back for about $800. So it's right. like, well, I'm just going to <laughs> I'm just fly yeah. over and get my banjo. That's, <laughs> so, that is so a it gorgeous was, It was piece. fun. That's and so, I would be I would be so OCD about that brass piece trying to keep it clean. Uh, you, you get over it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I see Jeff over in the corner going. It's kind of got like a like a steampunk vibe. Yeah, it does. It really yeah, does. Yeah, you get out the get out the flits and <laughs> so that's that's a really cool piece. But that's so, and it, it's a real treasure. And Rob, the he, he's a great friend, and I I I went over to get it and had money to pay for it he wouldn't take money you know and it's like yeah. so i i'm forever in debt to rob for such a beautiful instrument and i mean just we went through his shop and 
and I, there's a little video on my YouTube channel where I tour the shop and, and the old lathe that he's got is just, it, it's just a, I don't know how old that piece of machinery is, but it's it's still turning out awesome stuff. It's got a two speed truck transmission that he's rigged up to it, so he can have two different speeds. That sounds like it'll rip your arm right out of the socket. <laughs> it's 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 good stuff. So yeah, this is this is a Crawford Rob Crawford and Ballyhenge, Northern that is Ireland. Awesome. And, uh, so yeah, it's it's a lot you, of fun. If you're needing you needing a, a higher end piece. This, yeah, and, and Rob's stuff is not terribly expensive. And let's say you did want something from Rob. You can get something like this. I'm going to spitball. I could be way off. But I think you could get into something like this for about between $1,500 $2,000. And then you tack some shipping onto it. It's still a bargain yeah. for for handmade, handmade custom, custom instrument. Yeah. yeah, I mean, pro a pro-level instrument, I don't care what you play in. You're looking at $2,500, just about anything. Yeah, you know? and if you're not... It's not that instrument. Yeah. So, but that's, yeah, this one, he's got the goat skin head. I mean, it's. That's really cool. And, and again, the only thing he didn't make was the tuners, the strings, and some little screws. But, and he can. And he, he could have made he, the he screws. He could have made those. He was just. I, I mean, I know, get it. I mean, like, he made everything else. Yeah. It's, yeah. Even the, even the nuts, he made the little. Yeah. That's. That's, that's crazy. That is. And to make them all the same. Oh yeah, and yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, so it's a it's it's a, it's a fun piece. So that one's a that's good. It's a good story. That is a, that's a very good story. I love it. I love it. I play it behind that get fiddle. Ha ha ha! This is this is that the big story. Looks, that one looks fancy. Yeah, there's a lot of engraving on that Joker. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Goodness. That is, wow, I do believe that is George, you've had man. that for a long time, right? Yeah, so yeah. the story that goes with this, and when I was a kid learning to play, mom and dad were always like, dad especially, he was always like, when you get as good as Jimmy Henley, and Jimmy Henley was the kid that you would see on Hee Haw back in the day. And he, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy and I are the same age, or Jimmy passed away a few years ago, but he, same age, and but he was absolutely unbelievably good, especially for, you know, a kid. And so mom and dad were like, when you get when you get as good as Jimmy, we'll get you Gibson Master Tone you know, or whatever. And back then, only you know, only names we knew was Gibson Master Tone. If it wasn't yeah. that, it wasn't a banjo. And so, evidently, at some point, I got to that level where dad thought it would be all right for me to get a better instrument. And we started shopping. We, you know, looked at music stores everywhere. You know, went to Gruen and all, all the places that you would look for a higher end, better instrument and really wasn't finding anything. I had played a festival, a little fiddle contest they had at Lake Winnipesoka. Yeah. And uh, I ran into Clyde Blaylock, this old guy from Hickson. He had a little music store that in his house. Well, he had Stelling banjos. This is Stelling. And so he so he had Stelling. So uh, you know, I came home after the little festival. I was telling Dad, I said, we ought to go look at those banjos. So we rode up to his house, and he had a couple and didn't have anything that I really liked. But, you know, it's like, you got anything else? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, I got mine. So he went and went some other part of the house and came back with this. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's the one. I, I like that one. Love it first sight. I'm and sure. uh, he's like, "Well, I really wasn't really wasn't planning on selling that one." And uh, oh, that'll work. And uh, he uh, so he priced it, and I think it was twenty six fifty, two thousand six hundred fifty dollars, and that would have been nineteen eighty two. So that was a lot of money in 1982. That's yeah, twice that now. <laughs> Easy. Or, or more. Or more. And it's like we didn't have that kind of money with us. And so we left. You know, dreams kind of dashed a little bit. Not too bad. At least I knew where it was. And at least I kind of knew what I was looking for. And we're riding down the road. And Dad's like, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I really like it. He says, hang on. And so we pulled over to a 
to a pay phone <laughs> back in the pay phone days. Right. And so I called them up and said, hey, if I bring you $500, will you hold it until I can get you the rest of the money? And they're like, yeah, come on back. So we turned the car around, went back, and, uh, you know, I gave him the money. And his wife, Sue, comes out of the back with a, with a bottle of son of a gun, like cleaner stuff. And she's cleaned up the case and all and everything. She's got it in it, sitting there. And she fills out the card, you know, the little layaway card. Yeah. And we're getting ready to leave. And Clyde walks over and hands me the banjo. He says, just take it with you and pay on it when you can. And that's the first time we'd ever really met him. I mean, I saw him at the little festival, but you right. know, I didn't know him, know him. And he sure as heck didn't know me or my folks or anything. You know, so there was a lesson in trust there. And so, and we paid it off in, you know, real quick, like, you know. But, dad, I mean. Dad never liked to have any debt. And so, right, but, but for him to turn loose of it, not even knowing. This is not in a time when you can just pick up cell phone and. Yeah, with a. 17, 18 year old kid? I mean, you would have never. If, he, <laughs> if, if you didn't want to pay for that, you didn't have to. Yeah, I was probably know. 18, 17 or 18. But and, that's all I like to do the same thing so for people. It's, uh, <laughs> it's walnut. This one's walnut. And, Golly, uh, it's, that it's inlay walnut is walnut and overlay and engraved. The model is called the Gospel. So this banjo is pictured in a book called Masters of Five String Banjo that was done in the 80s. And this, 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 this is pictured, this is Ralph Stanley's banjo. This is the one that he's holding in that book. And so it's got his name engraved and it belonged to Ralph. He recorded Down Where the River Bends, that album with it. And so I wound up with it. Ralph, that would have been about the time that he started dealing with his Stanley tone banjos that Frank Neat was making. Uh -huh. And so Jeff Stelling, the build this, was like, well, you know, if you're not gonna play it, I'd like to have it back. And so he gave it back to Jeff and I wound up with it because Clyde was number one dealer for Stelling. And so I wound up with it that way and I've had it since. And it's, it was the primary banjo for a good 12 years or so until I started, you know, looking for other sounds. But this one's got a... It's got a really bright, it's punchy bright. sound. And so, hold on. So, everybody's clear. That is not a banjo like Ralph Stanley's. No, it's Ra it was Ralph's. It was Ralph's. And but, it's but right I, there on the pit guard. I've, I've owned it longer than Ralph. Well, <laughs> <laughs> technically, um, you know. Yeah, oh, no, it's yours for sure. But, but that is just, that's a piece of history. Yeah, it, it is. And to, to see you out still playing it. Yeah, I still I still That's carry it to awesome. a gig from time to time. It, it's a lot of fun to play. It's beautiful. The engravings on that thing are just nuts. And and so serial number on this banjo, and folks can look it up. It's on Stelling's website, and he has a chronology of everything he's built and who he built it for. Serial number seven seven seven. So all of his triple digit, double digit type serial number banjos. He always did something special. And so this was definitely one of those with extra engraving. I took it apart one time to clean it and banjos have a tone ring and that's this metal part that you can see right okay. there. Oh, okay. And all of that comes off. And so I took it all off to clean it under it. There's stuff under the tone ring that you don't see until you take the banjo that's apart. That's cool. You know, it's that like an Easter crazy. egg. I mean, yeah. so there, it, it's just really. That's it, one that, I mean, yes, it deserves to be hung on the wall and stared at, but it's it sounds so good. Oh, I know. It's such a great <laughs> <laughs> that thing yeah, sounds wow. okay. Oh, yeah, so yeah. definitely my favorite sounding of the ones you brought. Now, the fretless is it's, it's in a, a totally different, different, different league. It's a different it's, instrument. It's, it's a, a different totally instrument. different animal. But that Joker right there, 
Oh I, yeah, it's yeah, and, it, and it, you know I've played it for so long; it still feels like home. And and, and like between this and the recording king, they're they're so different. Yeah. And in the studio, this is wonderful in the studio. Because like studio engineers like this banjo, and because they can do so much with it. But I, I you know, because I, with drums, and that is a drum. <laughs> usually, producers hate drummers and dr like bongos and stuff because they're so hard to record right but man that thing just cuts through oh yeah, yeah. i feel like that's everything you want a banjo to sound like yes. yeah like, it, it sounds like a, what you think a banjo yeah, sounds like correct <laughs> I've enjoyed owning it and the bulk of the wear that's on this banjo is mine, there. but there's some things that are on here that Ralph did. And so like the finish on a couple of these brackets is completely worn off. And because Ralph hooked his strap on the brackets, it, okay, it, like a metal hook and it just that's, scraped the finish where really I cool. use, you know, this yeah, got a cradle yeah. strap. But, you know, so there's things on it. And, and I, you know, I still have the original head that came on it. I, I changed the head a couple of years ago. They get dirty and gross. Yeah. I mean, so how often do you have to change the head on? I usually don't change them until they break. Okay. I mean, that's probably the same so with they, drums. It, oh, well. Yeah. You put off a different sound? Is it something where it you, dull? you it... need to get more tone out of it or something? Uh, you know, unfortunately right now in the banjo world you've got one choice for a head it's a remo, remo. weather king that's right. it that's it mm. uh previously ludwig made heads for banjos really? and, and they, they sold them as five star and there were a couple other but yeah they they stopped making an 11 inch yeah head. i mean because drummers they don't have you don't have 11 inch anything we play all most of the time it's all even number yeah <laughs> yeah and so like 10 12 14 16 22 but not 11. See, so like both of these, the recording king of this, they're 11 inch. The, the Crawford, it's like 11 and 7 eighths. It's something, it's just a oddball shape. Well, that's, that you know? makes it even cooler. But I mean, so you can't buy a factory, you, hence the skin head on there. Right, it has to be an actual goat skin head. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So, so that, that, that's cool. Yeah, we'll that's definitely a, set that one up and get some close ups of that guy. Yeah. Cause I mean, there is some history with that, with that. With that piece for sure, that is, uh, it's hard not to stare at it. And it's a little heavier here. You can touch it. Everybody else has. <laughs> that one's heavier than that. Yeah, it's about 13 pounds. That is, uh, it's, it's artwork. It's that beautiful. I mean, to put that much effort into something that nobody will ever see. Yeah. <laughs> that's just the coolest thing. Yeah, it's a piece of art. That's it's amazing. a piece of art. It's awesome. I mean, that's the strap. You know, I've had that strap since I got the banjo. So that was kind of. Yeah. I mean, I mean you think about it. If you're playing out on stage, nobody's going to get close enough really to to really understand yeah. what is going on. I there. mean, they'll see that it's gold plated. They may be able to distinguish that it's engraved or whatever, but maybe not. But, but that's about the it. The extent of it. Yeah. But, you know, lots of banjos are gold plated. Lots of banjos are engraved. But, yeah. But they're not engraved with that name. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. yeah. And I love how they put gospel on on the inlay on yeah. the fretboard. That is gorgeous. Yep. So this he built this banjo in seventy July of seventy eight, I think. No kidding! Wow, so. that banjo is older than all of us, <laughs> except for me. That, but just the overlay on the back is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and there, he didn't miss a single. Mm -mm. thing and i'm sure they knew who it was going to right they had it, to... it, it's it's definitely you know they even they even engraved at the bottom of of the fretboard where the meets the oh yeah <laughs> and i'm sure underneath what you were talking about i'm yeah, sure there's, there's stuff, engravings there's stuff there. there there's other stuff yeah there's so much stuff and it's just like it's just the coolest thing ever That's and it, it's it, it's a it's a fun piece well, and, and i love to play it uh, I mean, I'm glad to see it's being played, <laughs> but that is the piece that you walk into, you see in a glass case at Carter Vince because of who held on to it before. I'm not saying that you're not great because you are, but yeah. just the name alone. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a great banjo, and I've I've 
I played it all over. You ought to take it to Carter and just let him do a do a uh, appraisal. Test, a, appraisal. Yeah, I could. I could do it. I kind of know would, what it's worth. And yeah. see, so Stelling Banches, he Jeff retired the end of 2022, so he's not building anymore. And so okay. prices on all of his instruments have just gone through the roof. Yeah. You know, he like the lowest, the cheapest thing that he made, and, and, which is great about what Jeff did. Like from the cheapest to the most expensive that he built, they're all the same. You're just buying bling. So the so he did a white star, which was diamond inlays, plain maple, just real simple. And so five or six years ago, those were going for about twenty five hundred bucks on the you know open market, and, and now they're starting about thirty six hundred. So they've gone up a thousand since he retired. Yeah, and they won't and, stop. And they're they're continuing to go up in price. So. Well, it's uh so but yeah. I kind of have an idea what it's worth. I I've seen similar ones sell. Like to buy this one new. Let's say I had ordered this new and right before okay. he, he right. right before he retired, it would have been fifteen thousand. <laughs> yeah. That's without the name that's on it. Without the name that's on it, right. Yeah, if I'd have wanted all the engraving, the gold plating. The extra work, all the stuff that you can't see, the, oh, uh, the yeah. overlay on the back, yeah, it would have been, it would have been in the, it had been five figures anyway. All right, let's talk about your, uh, oh, nice. oh man, let's talk about your effects. Talk about the board. Yeah, so I never, I, I, I play bluegrass. I never really thought I'd be plugging in much and being That's doing much. That's kind of new to me. I mean, but, but, but we do. And like I play with Lou Womp and Blue Tastic Fangrass in Chattanooga and, like they all plug in and we play a lot of stuff where, where it's, where you plug in. And like the thing I did on the Opry, you plug in. And so banjo pickups are awful. I don't care what you've got. They're all best case scenario. They're still bad. And I use the LR bags pickup in my banjos, but it still sounds like a pickup in a banjo. Yeah, and it's yeah. not really that great. It's a weird sound. And, but you know you make do so on the board there i've got my di which is the venue and but i've also got this voice print di which is this is this thing is awesome so you plug in with this and then you use your phone your phone has an app and you set it up different places and you record and it hears your instrument and then it also hears the feed that you're giving it electronically through the pickup, and then it will build a voice print of that instrument. It's almost like a modeler. And now when I plug in, I plug in, turn this on, it sounds like a banjo. And so the LR Bags voice print does that for that me. That is, is pretty great. stinking nifty. It's always yeah. bugged me like on acoustic guitars. I've noticed it. It sounds like crap. It doesn't this sound like a guitar. Fix, this fixes <laughs> that. This totally fixes that. Yeah. And it's... That's it's amazing. Cool. And then the LR bags reverb. It's just the good reverb for an acoustic instrument. I mean, there's all kind of reverb on the market, but most of them are geared toward electric guitar players. That's geared toward acoustic instruments. And okay. it sounds good. And then just to be goofy, I've got that, uh, Electro harmonics, small stone, <laughs> phase shifter, which you know, oh, that's because, cool. <laughs> because you know why not? Uh, yeah. I would, I would, that's like a wop. You need a wop pedal, Jim. Well, I you know oh. I've considered that, or there there's a couple other things I've. But nobody would have thought about it, that either. Well, there's there's a history for it, and like Pete Warnick has done it in the past, but. Like with Blue Tastics, we do, you know, we do a couple of songs from Fish. We do some Grateful Dead stuff. We do some definitely hippie grass kind yes. of stuff. Oh, yeah. You're, I'm, I'm hitting that button. Yeah. And, you know, and then we're going, yeah. you know, I love it. <laughs> yes, the phasers are, are really cool. <laughs> and so that that's kind of a board. And then the board itself, this is from Van Gogh. This is a new thing that they're doing. And, and there you can find them on Amazon. Oh, that's cool. All your, Van all it's a pow it. It's a powered board. And uh, it's got, um, you know, this this is 12 oh. volt, 9 volt, no. uh, different amperages. It's got all yeah. the plugins right it's here. Got it's got all the plugins. For, and then it's, it's, the, it's got the little LED display on the back. You can adjust it. It oh, moves okay. while you're playing. Cool. It, you know, it's good. But, that's but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic. I, I, and it's the... Uh, 
power is isolated on this mm-hmm. board. So if anybody's looking, you know, electric guitar player, whatever. Van check, Goa. Van Goa. And V-A-N-G-O-A. And I've I've been extremely pleased with this. That is, it's, 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 uh, I've I seen mean, a lot of pedal boards, but I've not seen one quite like this. Yeah, it's, you know. You've seen ones like mine. It's just wires everywhere. Well, right. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I've seen some so even like, neater that have. So the, there's the back that they can that see. That have the electronics built in, but right. not like this joker. Yeah. And, and so. It's very cool. It's a. Uh, and it, you know, it's aluminum, so it's not heavy. I'm moving it slow. I don't want to knock anything off. Right. But it, That's it, awesome. You know, it's, but it isolates its own power, so you're not going to get any humming. You don't get it. any hum or anything. It's 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 fantastic. And I've used I've used this a little bit. I had one of their smaller boards, and then I wound up getting this voice print. This this is yeah. the newest thing on here, and so I had to have a little well, this bit DI bigger board. Is pretty large. The DI is a big old thing, but it's got a tuner built in and. I can I can do everything with this that I can with that, but the thing I can do with this is I can lean over and turn a knob. I'm still I'm still there's yes. still the analog part of yes. me that wants to reach wants over to reach and, over and turn the knob. And with this, I you know it's it's a little more of a pain, but that one you know, and then it's got the boost it's got a boost pedal built in, which is handy. But yeah, now that I'm plugging in too, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a thing. Well, you banjo players out there need to step up your game. I want to see a wah pedal. Yeah, you got to give, give us a wah pedal. Yes. Uh, envelope filter. Is, is oh, yeah. Well, we have all kinds of fun. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. That is, that is really cool. I, I did a thing. Oh, gosh. This has been years and years and years ago with, with some guys that were a uh, Christian rock band. Uh-huh. And I had an electric banjo at the time during Crossfire. And I took my, took my Fender Twin and a and a uh, Ibanez tube screamer and <laughs> yes yes with <laughs> a banjo <sighs> the tube I played all, I played all the that. played all the guitar parts was just nice. fine that is crazy <laughs> that's really cool well guys I'm glad you got to uh, be introduced to Mr. Jim Panky please go check out his channels uh, TikTok Instagram YouTube, we're going to link them all in the description below. Yeah, I'm everywhere. Go show him some love. And hey, every time I watch him, I want to go find a banjo and learn how to play. All his stuff is free out there. You can go onto his sites and learn how to play an instrument. He teaches it very simple. I could follow, I could follow it. So jump on there. He goes live all the time. So just jump out there and uh, tell him what's up. Tell him where you came from. And uh, I reckon we'll see him next time. Y'all stay safe out there. What if I just, <laughs> what if I just cut the intro and the outro and that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. Hammered it. That's how that's I'm going to see Oh, that would be a great short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, would, that would, would be a great, be a great short. short. That would be a great <laughs> short. Like, Here's Jim. Hey, y'all. <laughs> well, thanks for see stopping you. by. That was Jim. <laughs> um,